Gompers and his allies favored something called pure and simple unionism. It meant using strikes and boycotts to fight for better pay and benefits rather than taking political action to create a whole new system. In 1886, Gompers helped found the American Federation of Labor, uniting individual unions across the country. As the AFL's first president, his salary would be less than he earned rolling cigars. Gomper's leadership of American workers would be challenged by socialists within and without the AFL. In 1901, some of these socialists came together to form the Socialist Party of America. At the party's helm was a rival labor leader, a railway man named Eugene V. Debs. Debs is a fascinating figure because he's one of these perennial candidates who runs for president five times uh, as a Socialist Party candidate. He achieves at most 6% of the vote, which he gets in 1912. Uh, but he's an enormously popular, charismatic figure, much more than Gompers uh, ever was. Originally, Gompers had hoped he and Debs would work together, but he ended up calling Debs the apostle of failure. Um, he was involved with the Western Labor Union, then the American Labor Union, then the IWW, and um, Gompers felt any attempt to organize a rival trade union was, in effect, doing the employer's job um, to weaken the union. You then had union fighting union. By 1903, the American Federation of Labor represented more than one and a half million union members and was becoming a force to be reckoned with in American life. At that year's AFL convention, Gompers forever parted ways with his old allies. I want to tell you socialists, he said, I have kept close watch upon your doctrines for 30 years, have been closely associated with many of you, and I want to say that I am entirely at variance with your philosophy. Economically, you are unsound, socially, you are wrong, industrially, you are an impossibility. Despite Gomper's opposition, the Socialist Party continued to gain strength. Surprisingly, the party drew more support from farmers than from industrial workers. One of the greatest centers of socialist support was Oklahoma. Eugene Debs won more than 16% of the presidential vote there in 1912. But America's entry to World War I brought a turning point for the party. In World War I, socialists in this country and around the world have to decide, will they support their individual nations in the war, or will they uh, support the International Socialist Brotherhood and oppose uh, the war of workers against other workers? And the American Socialist Party, unlike most of the European Socialist Parties, decides to oppose the U.S. government and to oppose World War I. And uh, most trade unionists, Gompers as their leader, uh, support the war. The more moderate socialists leave the party um, and actually work with Gompers in the AFL. Uh, the more radical socialists start speaking out against the war and they are arrested. Eugene Debs gets arrested in 1918, gets sentenced to 10 years in jail. Uh, and by the time he comes out of jail in 1921 when he's pardoned, the socialist party is pretty much a shell. The party would never regain its pre-war strength not even during the Great Depression. Gompers and the American Federation of Labor, later the AFL-CIO, had won out as the principal voice of America's workers. In many ways, Americanism proved to be a substitute for socialism for a lot of workers. After all, Americanism has always stood for uh, the, the average person being able to make it. The uh, American standard of living is something should that all Americans should be able to uh, enjoy. So the idea of class quality is something that undergirded the strength of socialism in Europe, but it's always been part of uh, the American vision uh, as well. So in many ways, Americanism trumped socialism and made socialism unnecessary as a vision for a lot of American workers.
but socialism would yet find life in North America. As the Socialist Party faded from the U.S. political scene, some of the farmers who had embraced its ideals would take their politics north, to Canada. Today, Americans think of Canada as a more radical, a more socialist place. Well, the irony is that uh, Canada's first socialist politicians, Canada's first socialist intellectuals are Americans. And that is something that people today have forgotten. Uh, socialism, when it comes to Canada in an effective way, is an American import. Between 1898 and 1915, nearly a million people emigrated from America to Canada. Lured by cheap farmland, most settled in the western Canadian provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, the last North American frontier. They brought their knowledge of how to wrest a living from the soil and a set of political convictions rooted in their experience. Farmers in the prairie provinces of Canada and the northern Great Plains of the United States all faced similar problems in the early 20th century. They were all growing wheat. They felt that they were being gouged by the railroads, by the bankers. They felt that the market conditions were working against them. Rather than seeing this in terms of impersonal market forces, they personalized it and viewed bankers, railroad men, lawyers as the, as the enemy. Uh, the way you express your protest at the turn of the century is, hey, wait a minute, why don't we nationalize these things? And from that, uh, as the institutions resist, you move uh, fairly logically and pretty quickly towards radicalism. And they're radicalized in Canada in the same way, by the same people, in the same organizations as they are in the United States. But let me emphasize, these organizations start not in Canada, but in the United States. Every major U.S. farmers organization would resurface in Canada in some form. By the 1920s, these organizations and their successors began to make their voices heard throughout the prairie provinces. They were very soon able to influence electoral politics in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta simply by the power of their numbers. But it's really not until the Great Depression begins on the prairies, really in the 1920s, not the 1930s, with drought, with the collapse of the wheat market, that farmers began to contemplate forming their own independent political force. In 1932, a new political party emerged from a conference in Saskatchewan, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the CCF. The CCF is a kind of big bang among radical groups. Uh, radical farmers, uh, socialist labor unions, and radicalized socialist intellectuals, many in universities, many also in the Protestant churches. Uh, and they get together and they write a platform that calls for the socialization essentially of the means of production and the means of finance. I mean, it's, it's, it is a classic socialist platform. The party would later moderate its platform to appeal to a broader base. In 1944, the CCF swept the provincial elections in Saskatchewan, becoming the first socialist government in North America and leaving a lasting imprint on Canadian politics. Well, the CCF stayed in power in Saskatchewan until 1964, and uh, one of its last acts was to bring in a socialized medicine scheme for the province of Saskatchewan, uh, which they imposed in the early 1960s, and which had such tremendous appeal that it actually pushed Canadian politics in that direction later in the 1960s. Uh, the CCF's ideas were adopted by the governing Liberal Party of Canada, and the Liberals were the ones who finally brought in National Medicare uh, in, in Canada. Socialism found more of a following in Canada than in the United States. In 1961, the CCF became the new Democratic Party. It is still largely socialist in its convictions and still a force in Canadian politics. In America, some of the ideas championed by socialists 
also found their way into the mainstream. Ideas like unemployment insurance, social security, and the eight-hour workday. But socialism itself never took root. Be sure to join us for the second episode of Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. To learn more about Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism, visit us online at pbs.org. You'll find complete interviews and more about the people and events that shape socialism around the world. Next time on Heaven on Earth, from China to Britain to Israel to Africa, a new generation of leaders brings to life radically diverse visions as socialism comes to power around the globe.